Hi, welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. I'm Sarah Clement. I'll be your host tonight. Tonight we're talking about dangerous products in the home and in our sub stomachs. So if you're new here, we are a coalition of skeptics groups groups from around the country, um, born out of the COVID-19 pandemic, because obviously we can't meet up with each other in pubs, so we decided to have talks. So we're here every Thursday, we're broadcast live on Twitch, but you can also visit our uh, YouTube channel. And um, tonight, as I say, we have um, a talk about dangerous products in our homes and in our stomachs. Um, if you haven't seen the very wonderful uh, book we read about lead and marketing lead for children, well, then you're in for a treat because we are going to be talking about more wonderful things in a similar vein. So one of the great things about tonight's talk is that we have actually two people talking tonight, and that's David Frank and Virginia Ng. So David Frank is a marketer, a writer, and a former radio host. He's a former event uh, uh, organizer for Perth Skeptics in Australia. That's how I met him many years ago. And um, Edinburgh Skeptics here in the UK. So pre-COVID, he toured talks across a dozen skeptics in, in the pub groups here in the UK on such topics as how you market yourself on online dating. Love his online dating talk. It's so good. Um, and how big tobacco circumvents marketing restrictions, the latter of which you can watch on his website. And he has a master's degree in science and marketing from Edinburgh, Edinburgh Napier University. And he's currently based in Seattle. He really gets around, lives in Tokyo as well. Um, so of course, very important. David is free range, organic, with no added hormones or unnecessary antibiotics. Virginia Ng is a, a food microbiologist and is the director of regulations and food processing at the Seafood Products Association in Seattle. She has a master's of science in biological sciences from California State Polytechnic University, Panoma, where she studied toxin formation and uh, sporulation patterns. I'm sorry if I botched that. In various clostridium botulinum strains, might have also butchered that, uh, in her day job, among other things. She is a sensory expert using organoleptic analyses, I really should have practiced this, to keep good quality seafood on the shelves. She's previously given talks on food preservation. Um, so Virginia's vices include ice cream, the extra dose of cosmic radiation that comes with flying, please give me more of that, and movie marathons. Okay, so tonight's talk will be roughly an hour followed by Q&As, but as they say, the dose makes the poison. Side effects may include low blood pressure, high blood pressure, constipation, diarrhea, insomnia, narcolepsy, drowning, dehydration, and seizures, and sudden death. Please put your hands together for David Frank and Virginia Ng. Thank you, Sarah. And good evening, skeptics in the pub UK and everyone watching, uh, not just live, but also the recording. My name is David Frank. And I'm Virginia Ng. And welcome. Today, so today's talk is titled Skep um, Dangerous Products in the Home and in Our Stomachs. And what we're going to do is we are going to talk about dangerous products historically, think things like DDT and, and, uh, and lead plates. Uh, Products that turned out to be perfectly safe, followed by some dangerous products that we definitely should avoid that turned out to be uh, dangerous, but are still on the market today. Uh, dangerous products that are okay in moderation, like for me, junk food. And uh, we're going to finish with just a few tips on how to research, followed by a Q&A. Virginia. So David's slides are going to be super fun and colorful and beautiful. And my slides are going to be really gloomy. And this is how you get sick. So I want you to remember that the information we share with you is uh, we hope that it doesn't necessarily um, incite fear, but rather it empowers you. The first product that we are going to talk about is DDT. Virginia, how do I say that word? Why don't you give it a go, David? <laughs> and in my accent as well, this makes it so much harder. So I, I, I give it a go every talk and I get better every time. Dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. How am I going? That, that'll work. Yeah. That'll do. That'll do. 
Okay, so the use for this artificial compound was discovered by Paul Herman Muller. And I had to put in effort to find an evil looking photo of this Nobel Prize winner. And this is a really good example of why we pause for a little while before giving people Nobel Prizes for discoveries, because this one turned out to be not so good. Now, he discovered its use in killing typhus, killing body lice and malaria causing mosquitoes. And it was available in all sorts of product packaging. Before we had the aerosol can that we are very familiar with today, we had the slightly ominous looking flit plunger, which was on the market. And it was available in all sorts of forms from powders and liquids through to you could get things impregnated with this chemical. And it was spread everywhere on in the public onto people. It was spread on farms. And so even if you chose not to buy products with it um, that had it on the label, your food might be contaminated with it. And uh, in the Q&A, go ahead and ask about um, pesticides and, and, and foods that are better and foods that are worse for it, if anyone's interested in that. Now, it was also, you know, you marketed as safe for children. And here we see some decorating with DDT, with some DDT-laced wallpaper. Oh, look, Donald Duck. Golly, there's Pluto too. Notice what's not there, Plasmodium, the uh, name for mal the malaria-causing parasite. It was indeed marketed as safe for children, as we can see in these ads. You know, a picture of a baby. Um, here we've got an anthropomorphized cute baby elephant holding one of those flit plungers but what what really interests me uh now this 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 banner ddt is good for me wasn't an actual song from what i could tell um although there is a ton of pro tobacco music out there i recently came across a treasure trove of that but it was in all sorts of advertising marketed as safe for children my favorite is this bugaboo insect spray with the with the sad sentenced to die and a very sad looking mosquito. But as we know now, DDT is bad for us and bad for the greater environment. At least in the US, it was fully banned in 1972. DDT is especially dangerous because of its strong stability in the environment, which means it's able to biomagnify and work its way up the food chain. A recent study showed an association between DDT and autism. A hypothesis for this study is that DDT can cause low birth weight and premature birth, which are known risks for autism. Next up, we've got thallium, an element on the periodic table. Now, initially in 1930, it was sold as a hair removal cream, but within a couple of years, it was withdrawn from the market because it was determined to be a pretty nasty poison. And then it was sold, once it was found its use as a poison, uh, sold as a rodenticide, as we can see in this incredibly racist ad from the early 20th century. In Australia in the 1950s, they had what was dubbed then a thallium craze. Now, I love the term thallium craze because it reminds me of the 1996 Tickle Me Elmo craze or the scooter craze. And according to Wikipedia, they've got a, a whole list of, well, murders in Australia from the 1950s. There were some people who got honorary mentions in the Darwin Awards from some accidental thallium poisoning. Apparently, there were some Russian soldiers on a remote Siberian airbase who found some canisters filled with this white powder, and they did what young men are often want to do, and they, they messed around with it. They used it instead of talcum powder on their sweaty feet, they put it in their rolled up tobacco and smoked it, and they even snorted it. They had to be airlifted to the nearest hospital, and they got honorary mentions in the Darwin Awards as a result. Thallium makes an appearance in many popular media uh, things from Agatha Christie's The Pale Horse through to the 007 film Spectre. So once inside your body, thallium behaves chemically in a similar manner to potassium and sodium ions, which are commonly found in your nervous system. Because of this similarity, thallium hijacks this mechanism that helps to send messages from your brain to the rest of your body, in turn causing severe neurological symptoms. 
Next up, we're going to talk about lead, also known as Venetian ceruse or spirits of satin when it's used in makeup. And a uh, shout out to everyone on Twitch right now having a chat. Bonus points to who remembers which monarch famously wore lead-based white makeup. Now, it is it is quite a, a good makeup, you know, this lead-based look, perfect for spring. Uh, you could definitely wear this every day, but it's also easy to zhuzh up at night for some with some milk, mercuric sulfide or a few drops of belladonna. I stole that joke wholesale from the Ask a Mortician YouTube channel. I love Kate Doty's work. I highly recommend it. Seriously, though, it, it'll, it'll age you and poison you. And just looking at the chat, I can already see... Elizabeth I in the 14th century was the uh, famous English monarch who would wear it. Now, here's the thing. As the monarch, you get lots of paint portraits painted of you. And uh, genuinely, if you want to keep your head as the court painter, you want to do a flattering portrait of the monarch. And in this case, uh, her skin did deteriorate severely. This is covered in many movies about Elizabeth I. And their solution was to paint increasingly abstract paintings of the Queen. And I highly recommend you just type into Google image search Queen Elizabeth I and check those out. Now, what I also find interesting is how you get a white powder from metallic lead. What What's the process going on there? So what they do, or what they used to do, is they would get the, the rock and they, the mineral and they would mix it with some vinegar and they would bury it in cow dung. And that, uh, I want to make sure I get it right, exothermic, no, endothermic reaction, right? <laughs> yes, I have a master's in science, but it's more consumer behavior based. Uh, the endothermic reaction produces heat, uh, the bacteria and and stuff breaking down the cow dung produce heat um and so uh the, the the chemical reaction takes that heat and out of the darkness out of that cow dung you get this brilliant white powder which you can then poison yourself with at your leisure there are many other products that contained lead and if you haven't checked it out already on the skeptics in the pub youtube channel we've got a promo video from a week ago of myself Virginia and Sarah reading out this book called The Dutch Boys Lead Party. And in it, um, it's it's one mechanism through which the paint industry promoted lead as safe for children. And it also shows all the many different things in the household that contained lead. Now, we know about lead-based paint, which is a huge problem still in the US today, and there are even advertising campaigns about it. It's present in bullets, uh, leaded petrol or gasoline for our American friends. And uh, we've also got lead-based pipes. Now, the reason why lead is in plumbing is because it's very malleable and uh, it lasts a long time. And that's where we get the word plumbing from. The word for lead in Latin is plumbum. And they used it in things to do with other water-related things, like they would make their pots and pans out of it. Were they necessarily poisoned by that? Well, probably not. Not quite sure. Uh, certainly they knew that lead was poisonous because the slaves who were mining lead came down with the symptoms that Virginia is about to discuss. The sad thing about lead is it tastes sweet. And though it was used as an artificial sweetener back in Roman times, today this is why a lot of children will lick lead paint. So when in your body, lead's, lead binds strongly to your sulfur hydro groups. And these sulfur hydro groups are in charge of a lot of things in your body. Um, so when it's hindered, a lot of these functions kind of get uh, get broken down as well. So for instance, your heme production fails, so blood can no longer carry oxygen from one area to another. Your nervous system can't communicate with itself, and your growth, memory, and learning are also inhibited, which makes it a serious problem for children who are still developing in these uh, parts of their bodies. Next up, we've got arsenic, also known as inheritance powder. Now, Arsenic has been used in, in many, many ways. And what I found really interesting was people knew it was poison. It would be labeled poison, but they thought that the dose makes the poison. But this is an example of a poison where there is no safe dosage. 
It was, of course, used as rodenticide. And I highly recommend several books on the topic. Uh, my favorite is Bitten by Witch Fever, which not only talks about the history of lead products, but also includes these beautiful samples of lead-based wallpapers or lead containing wallpapers for the dyes um, this is obviously a reprint but the originals are still very very dangerous another interesting use of uh, arsenic powder was on fly sweets uh, sheets excuse me so being australian i know that this used to exist in my great grandparents era you'd put a fly sheet on the wall flies would land on it they'd get poisoned by the arsenic but before they succumb they might fly away and land on your food and thus you would get a little bit of arsenic poison. Oh, Virginia, what happens with arsenic, arsenic poison? Well, arsenic loves sulfur hydro groups just like uh, the lead. So you find similar manifestations as previously mentioned. Mercury, also known as quicksilver. Mercury was used in the production of felt hats. They had to do it when they moved from beaver fur to rabbit fur, when the European beavers started to become endangered. And to this day, a lot of these felt hats are very poisonous and they still give off mercury vapor, which is why the uh, some of the felt hats at the Victorian Albert Museum in London have to be stored in mylar plastic bags. And um, these are covered in another very good book that I recommend called Fashion Victims. Uh, the manufacturer of products is not covered in the scope of our talk, just the consumer aspect of it, but that was still pretty bad. Um, as was uh, the over-the-counter antiseptic mercurochrome, which until 1998 contained some mercury. The picture of the two men in top hats is there to represent the fact that daguerreotype photographs, early photographs, used to contain some lead, and even some makeup contained, not lead, excuse me, mercury uh and some makeup used to contain mercury as well virginia what happens with uh, the human body well because 80 percent of elemental mercury is inhaled and can cross the cell barriers it will easily get through your blood brain barrier and starts accumulating in your brain and this accumulation over time causes changes in your central nervous system like behavioral changes which are uh, associated with that mad as a hatter saying next up we've got unusual electric products now these were, like a lot of the other things uh, in this talk, sold as cure-alls or sometimes for very specific things. Here we've got the electric vitality belt, and you can see here where it attaches to the gentleman's vital parts. Uh, the uh, electrotherapy was sold as a bit of a cure-all. Uh, this particular product, um, it had a specific thing that it said it could do, and that was self-cauterization. Do not cauterize your own wounds at home using electric devices. Uh, not because you might get electrocuted. Yes, that's a distinct possibility. But also because those wounds, once cauterized, are very prone to infection. Use other means. Use a tourniquet. Apply pressure. Um, follow modern first aid procedures. My favorite product that was electric though, was the electric tablecloth. Now it did a couple of things. Number one, it uh, had these wires running up and down it and they're uninsulated and they created resistance. And um, it was an electric blanket basically. So you could have a heated tablecloth, which in the early 19th, uh, sorry, excuse me, early 20th century, about the, the 1910s, um, you know, it was a cool nifty thing to have, but you could also jam electric candles, also known as light bulbs, into the tablecloth and you would have these lights on the table without any running wires. Again, nifty, but you have these uninsulated electric wires running up and down it. So if you were to spill a liquid on the tablecloth, that might be the last opportunity you ever get to do that again. Next up, we've got asbestos, which was kind of everywhere in construction. Uh, from like things you wouldn't even think about, like a wire insulation. So there would be sometimes household products that themselves didn't contain asbestos, but the wiring might, such as a slow cooker or a toaster. Next up, we've got 
Micronite filters in Kent brand cigarettes. And again, some of the jingles and advertisements you can watch on YouTube are hilarious. Yes, people were inhaling asbestos filters, uh, filter particles, and it had side effects. Um, now, we're talking not just about historical products, but also modern ones. Asbestos sometimes contaminates talcum powder. And talcum powder is sold as safe for use with babies. It's sold as ba babies, uh, baby powder. And Johnson & Johnson are in trouble at the moment because some of theirs was contaminated. And the reason why talcum powder gets contaminated with asbestos is because when it's mined, asbestos and talcum are found in veins next to each other in the earth's crust. Talcum powder uh, and asbestos sometimes are also found as contaminants in uh, eyeshadow makeup and sometimes foundation as well. It's quite the interesting rabbit hole, although I will say that most modern safety standards are pretty good. Make sure you're buying from reputable sources though and not buying counterfeit goods. Now, there were uh, asbestos products were throughout the car, but also, sorry, throughout the home, but also throughout the car and as well, trains and planes and trucks. One interesting thing was that they, they used asbestos in brake pads. And so when you braked your car, little bits of asbestos um, dust would be shed in your neighborhood, which just isn't good for you. So asbestos fibers mind their own business unless they're loose and or you disturb them. But once inside your body uh, via inhalation or ingestion, your immune cells um, automatically realize that they're enemies. So they deploy these things called free radicals to try to combat them. But because asbestos fibers cannot be broken down, there's this buildup of free radicals which causes scarring because they're trying to repair something um, and happens to be your own cells. And this ultimately leads to mesothelioma, uh, which is cancer. If you have stories about asbestos in your home or the home you grew up in, please share it with us on the Twitch stream or in the Q&A on Slido. Next up, we've got x-ray hair removal. This was sold all the way up until the 1970s. And according um, to Trico System ads gathered by the Museum of Questionable Medical Devices, this was a harmless way to avoid, and I quote, futile, dangerous, and injurious means of removing disfiguring superfluous hair. That's right. When x-ray experimenters started losing hair, clinics popped up offering x-ray hair removal. Clients would receive a four-minute dose of x-rays directly to the face, often once a week for several months. And yes, it could be an effective permanent method of hair removal. There were also x-ray shoe fitting machines, and I know one member of our Seattle audience did use one when she was a kid growing up in Seattle at the Northgate Mall. So if any of you saw these in the wild, please let us know. I know that Edinburgh's, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the museum, National Museum Scotland, have one of these that they don't put out on display, but I have seen it. And what these would do is, you know, you if you're a kid, you put your, your debbies, put your, your feet under there and you could look through the scope and there's a scope for your parent and a scope for the, for the salesperson as well. And you could all see how far up your toes go in the shoes. Now, the weird thing is feet and hands are surprisingly resilient to radiation damage compared to the rest of the body. However, it was the salespeople who received the re repeat exposures from these often poorly ins insulated x-ray machines. So David mentioned that x-rays were used for hair loss, but people also used to get burns because early x-ray dosages were 1,500 times more than they are today and also took 90 minutes to produce an image versus the 20 milliseconds uh, it takes nowadays. Next up, we've got products that were radioactive. So uh, there were plates that were painted with radioactive uh, uranium containing paint that was slightly radioactive. And also there were was glassware sold under different names from Vaseline glass through to custard glass that would fluoresce green under ultraviolet or black light. And both of these items 
are highly desired collectible items you can still buy today. Uh, eBay is a really good place to buy them. If you'd like to buy me some and I could start my collection, that would be awesome. You know, I could pull out the the Geiger counter or just turn on the black light. Now, for the glassware, it wasn't the the fact that it was radioactive that caused them to glow. They didn't glow. They uh, fluoresced. So it was only under UV light that they would look that green. And it wasn't because they were radioactive. It was just a chemical property of uranium. For example, in that photo, there's a, I think there's a glass, con- uh, not pre- contaminated, but impregnated with manganese. It's not radioactive, but it fluoresces orange or red under UV light. Next up, we've got the Atomic Energy Lab kits. Now, these were discontinued, not because of the danger, but because they didn't sell very well. You know, uranium powder and a Geiger counter was not as exciting as the reactive chemistry sets, which competed with them. The chemistry sets went bang, fizzled, and changed color. While um, they were more exciting, they were also incredibly dangerous. They contained thin test tubes and caustic, flammable, and explosive chemicals, which burned, blinded, and killed kids. The good news is that many of the surviving kids went on to become prominent scientists today and cite these kits as sparking their interest in science. There was also the energy drink before we had modern energy drinks. Radi- uh, Radithor was one brand that contained radium, and there was one famous proponent, a very famous American socialite, athlete, and industrially industrialist called Eben Byers, who would down five of these per day and sent crates of this product to his friends. By the time he succumbed after a slow and painful death, he was so radioactive that he had to be buried in a lead-lined casket. And if you're interested in the really sad story of his demise, I can highly recommend the book Quackery. A Brief History of the Worst Ways to Cure Everything by a couple Pacific Northwesters uh, from Oregon, south of Washington State, where we are in Seattle, Dr. Lydia Kang and Nate Pedersen. If you can get the audiobook as well, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. What does it do to the body, though? So all this talk of radiation is probably making everyone really nervous, but we are surrounded by radiation. We even emit some ourselves. The difference is that on one side of the spectrum, we have non-ionizing radiation, which have very low energy. So they cannot do much harm to us. As you start moving over to the other side of the spectrum, the energy level increases and you pass this threshold where the energy is so strong that it will damage your DNA. And this high energy belongs to the other type of radiation called ionizing. There's also the fact that we're exposed to radiation on a daily basis. There is, after all, background radiation. And as we can see in this chart from xkcd.com, which I highly recommend. Two of those massive blue blocks is your background everyday dose. So a dental x-ray, for example, is equivalent to half a day's dose. And a flight across the United States from New York to LA is equivalent to four days dose. This is kind of what I find useful for helping me understand how bad is radiation. Now, uh, oh, there was also the interesting uh, the fact that <laughs> there is a, the, a very small amount in, um, in bananas. And hence, we actually get the unit of radiation, the BEV, the banana equivalent dose. And recently, I asked someone at the hospital who works in the radiation, radioactive therapy ward um, what something was equal to. And he, co- he couldn't remember. So if someone can look it up and let us know in the comments or in the, the Twitch stream or in the Q&A, please let me know. Uh, next up, we've got, and we're going to bring in Sarah for this, Olestra. So, Sarah, are you there? I'm here. Hopefully everyone can see me. Now, when I met Sarah back at Perth Skeptics in Australia, Sarah told me about Olestra. Sarah, tell us about Olestra. Well, saying as a person who grew up with a mother who was always on a diet, And if you grew up during the time that people were like, you know what, 
Low fat is all that matters. Put as much other stuff as you want, but as long as it's low fat, just give it to me. Give me as much as you want. And I had friends that would come over and they'd be like, Sarah, do you have any snacks? I'd be like, mm, we don't have snacks. My mom does not let us have snacks. She's always on a diet. And then I dated this guy who, you know, Let's imagine a big American football player. And he said, what are you talking about? You've got snacks. You've got these Pringles. There's these amazing Pringles. So he pulls out the Pringles. And in my head, I'm like, this is going to be brilliant. And he, he eats the Pringles. And he just, you know, he's a big guy. And he just eats every single one of them. And I was like, Danny, did I think maybe you should turn over that packet after he'd eaten the entire tube. And... I would like to tell you that, oh, hello, Pandora, um, <laughs> that you shouldn't eat the entire tube. And I said, why don't you read this? <laughs> and he read it out loud and he said, it said, may cause anal leakage. And I was like, yeah, shouldn't have eaten it, should you? <laughs> so, I mean, there's a, there's a few lessons here, obviously, and it was okay in the 90s not okay anymore but also maybe maybe not eat the whole thing before somebody tells you why they're telling you no stop don't do it so yeah that was that was my favorite illustrious story enjoy okay robin williams has a stand-up set where he mentions that he goes you know bob might want to hop out of the hot tub um okay sarah stay on screen stay with us because i i want to i want to hear i want Sorry. He didn't have a good afternoon. I'm not going to tell you the rest of it, but he did not have a good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I've got a script to read, Sarah, and I've got to, this is serious stuff. I need to do it with a straight face. <sighs> okay, so yes, the 90s. Yes, it was a fat replacement. Yes, it caused anal leakage. So happy to find that font. Um, it did have the side effect as well of impeding vitamin absorption. It's not a natural chemical. Um. You know, the the leaky history of, Ole, of Olestra is, is fascinating. Uh, that's right. After an explosive market debut where customers like Sarah's mom were just gushing about this wonderful product, this gut-wrenching story ends not in darkness. For Olestra escaped the bowels of product development hell and came out the other end repurposed, I kid you not, as a machine lubricant and an additive in deck stains. I did not know this. This is this is live surprise. I did not know this. But what's happening to my mother's insides now? I'm I'm sure she's fine. I'm sure she's fine. So, <laughs> so what what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Virginia explain fats in the body, and then if I might, I might so. I'll get you back in a second after that because there's another product I want to get your opinion on. Okay, so Virginia. So fats have had a historically bad reputation. Um, the 19, 1977 low fat guideline essentially said hard animal fats like butter and lard are bad for you and that liquid vegetable fat is good for you. So the food companies were thinking, how can we make vegetable oil rigid like butter so people will feel better about themselves. See, David, I can do puns too. Enter hydrogenated margarine, where food companies would put vegetable oil in this huge vat along with hydrogen ions in the form of bubbles. And the concept and goal uh, of hydrogenation was to force hydrogens into the vegetable oil's backbone in order to make it rigid like saturated fats. Unfortunately, incomplete hydrogenation resulted in trans fats, which actually increases the cholesterol in your arteries and makes you more prone to heart disease. Okay, next up, I want to get Sarah ba back. I want to know if she can guess this one. So this is a historical dangerous product. It is theoretically available in the market still over the internet. And I want to know if, Sarah, you can guess what this product is, okay? Okay. I'm going to read out the original ad. Eat, 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 and always stay thin. No diet, no baths, no exercise. Fat, the enemy that is shortening your life, banished. 
How? Want to guess? Oh Give some clues. Oh my god, this is really hard. Did Easy it, uh, to swallow. No ill effects. No danger. This sounds like something else. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Okay, it's, okay. I was it, so steeped in diet culture. I'm. I. I don't know. So, I feel. I feel bad for not remembering this. Well, it was before any of our times, but still rears its ugly head every now and then. Uh, and, and we're talking here about sanitized tapeworms. Friends for a fair form. <laughs> yes. Okay. Gotcha. Excellent. Sorry, okay. I missed that one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So okay, Tyra, bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tyra Banks did an episode of a show where she got some doctors in to talk about this. Is this a thing you want to do? No, do, do not. Uh, the tapeworm can get lost in your body. Uh, you might get malnourished, anemic, all sorts of issues. Although um, Kim Kardashian is quoted as saying she would do anything for a tapeworm. And there was a woman in Ohio who got her hands on some from the internet, got very sick, and the, the Ohio Health Board had to um, issue a statement saying, please do not buy tapeworm, egg, tapeworm eggs off the internet. Please don't. Um, hopefully the weirdest thing I had to do that year. I don't even remember if it's Ohio, Idaho, or Iowa. I, it's on another slide that I got in the wrong order of this slide. Do you remember, Virginia? You're American. Oh, it's in the middle bit. <laughs> we'll look it up later. Does it really matter? Okay. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about some products that turned out to be perfectly fine. Uh, Virginia. <laughs> Um, so saccharin uh, was discovered in 1878 and was used widely up until a 1977 study showed that saccharin caused bladder cancer in rats. Um, because of this study, there was a ban on saccharin, which pissed off a bunch of customer or consumers because that was their alternative to sugar. So the government uh, changed it to just a warning and not a ban. With more research into the 1990s, studies concluded that saccharin only causes bladder cancer in male rats because of their unique biology. Um, male rats have urinary bladders with a high pH, high protein and high sodium ion levels that when combined with saccharin causes crystals to form. And these crystals start to irritate the uh, bladder and promotes cancer cell production. So as a result of all of these studies um, in the 2000, uh, the saccharin was actually removed from the carcinogens list. Now, this study was just in rats and there's a huge, not YouTube, there's a Twitter account called just in mice there's another one just in rats um dedicated to this where scientific research was done just in rodents and then the media reports on it and what this twitter feed does is it calls out the media publications for example exercise during pregnancy protects children from obesity study finds in mice keto diet not effective causes blood sugar problems in women in mice scientists create antibody that defeats coronavirus in lab this is an article from may 7 2020 in mice whereas we know that what really the media should be talking about how the the best way to combat coronavirus um before we had the vaccine was by wearing a face mask this was indeed retweeted by the just says in mice twitter channel and um I'm going to give it a few seconds in the Twitch feed. Does anyone spot something wrong with the Just Says in Mice channel retweeting this photo? I'm going to give it a few seconds. Okay. That is not a mouse. That is a hamster. Well done if any of you spotted that. It's cute nonetheless. Seriously, though, this is a huge problem. And if you... If you tag that account, it will retweet what you say. So you can be a bit of a citizen journalist. And there are similar ones to it, such as Just Says Risks, where you can learn about absolute versus relative risks. Uh, there's obviously Just Says in Rats. There's Only in Men, because gender bias in research is a problem. And Say Sample Size, because so many places don't report on it when it gets to the media. So tomatoes were once believed to be dangerous, as depicted by this 1988 Return of the Killer Tomatoes movie starring George Clooney. 
it's important to understand that the acidic tomatoes, the acidity um, was the reason why, because tomatoes were served on ancient pewter plates that were made with lead. And this acidity of the tomatoes would actually leach out the lead from the plates and you would be dying from the lead and not the fruit. Next up, we've got Attack of the Killer Potatoes. Hands up if you if you saw this or bought any of the scholastic books when you were a kid. When potatoes, just like tomatoes, were first introduced to the new world, they were thought to be uh, poisonous. Uh, they resembled belladonna and other members of the toxic deadly nightshade family. Now, uh, Antoine Augustin Parmentier, according to the famous story, was a French pharmacist, pharmacist nutritionist, and a potato promoter. Uh, what happened was he was serving in the French army. He was captured by the Prussians, and the Prussians would feed potatoes to their prisoners of war. Eventually, he got out and um, he did some some research, found out, you know, potatoes are actually pretty healthy and they're perfectly safe. I mean, all the prisoners ate it. But there was still a lot of public uh, backlash against the concept of eating it. Uh, they thought it spread leprosy and other horrible diseases. So what did he do? Well, the story says, and I have no idea if this is true, he bought a plot of land. He planted a potato field. This is just before the French Revolution, so there were starving peasants about, but they still wouldn't touch the potato. He, pl- he placed armed guards around his field to attract the attention of the local peasantry, and um, he instructed them to accept any and all bribes, no matter how large or small, from people trying to steal the potatoes to grow it for themselves, because if the nobility are growing it, it must be good. And that is apparently how he overcame that hump. Um, so uh, mobile phones are perceived by some to be dangerous, uh, but remember that cell phones emit this low energy level um, of nion- ionizing radiation. And the real danger from cell phone use is when you get into a car accident, like the other 70,000 people per year on U.S. roads, or you fall into a hole like this lady did because she wasn't paying attention to her surroundings. So we've been talking a lot about uh, non-ionizing radiation. An example of ionizing radiation uh, that we use today is use of irradiation for food, uh, which is important in killing dangerous bacteria uh, that can cause food board illness as well as spoil um, the food. And irradiated food and irradiation can also kill invasive insects in quarantine fruit from other countries. But just because you eat irradiated food doesn't mean that you yourself are irradiated. Next up, we've got some current dangerous foods that you should probably avoid. And hopefully you go away with some tools today. Um, And one tool is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, which is under the World Health Organization. IARC does not conduct new research, but instead they look at uh, peer-reviewed, and uh, countless peer-reviewed research to help determine if a, con- if a compound is cancerous. And there are five categories. Compounds in category one means that without a doubt, all the research says that it is cancerous. Category 2A and 2B is probably and possibly because uh, cancerous because there's not enough uh, research in humans. And most analyzed compounds fall into category three, where the research is inconclusive. And the final category, category four, is without a doubt, all the research says that this compound is not cancerous. The problem with IARC is that it looks at the strength of the evidence and not how uh, carcinogenic it is. So just because two products are in the same category, they might have different risks. I'm going to just mention the Prop 65 warnings in uh, California. When you visit California, they're everywhere, outside buildings and on almost everything you buy. Um, they do make it into the greater US to a lesser extent. Uh, and I saw a couple things make its way to Scotland when I was living there. Um, Basically, because everything, there's evidence for everything almost being able theoretically to cause cancer, the labels can be on many things. And we can talk about that in the Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, Virginia, do I cause cancer? No, you're just an irritant. Lovely. Raw milk, though. I've actually had this here in Washington State, but I'll let you go, Virginia. 
<laughs> so bacteria can be found um, everywhere and also in feces and urine that trickles down onto the cow's udder before milking. And bacteria can be found during infection of the mammary glands, and it can also be shed internally through these milking cows. So the point of pasteurization is to kill these dangerous bacteria by heating up the milk right below its boiling point. Um, raw milk does not use pasteurization, which is why it is considered dangerous, uh, especially to those who are immunocompromised. Next up, dangerous products that you buy anyway. So things that are only good in moderation. I'll give you some examples. Personally, I'm a big fan of using Facebook, even though it erodes, 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 even though it erodes red leather, yellow leather, even though it erodes my privacy and my democracy. I use credit cards because I get rewards and I use loyalty cards at shops because again, I get rewards. I'm willing to make that trade and that's a conscious thing I'm willing to do. There are all sorts of things that are uh, considered safe but dangerous in a very high dose because of course, dose makes the poison. Now, when uh, scuba divers fill their tanks, they know that they don't put in pure oxygen most of the time because it'll send you blind. High doses of water will kill you, as anyone who's had drug education should know can happen when you ingest ecstasy or MDMA. Not covered in the scope of this talk is unusual uses of everyday products, but I'll give you one example. There's a famous story of a man who sued a company because he got what's called popcorn lung. So it was a disease of the lungs. And what happened was his daily ritual was to microwave a bag of microwave popcorn. He'd open up the, the bag and he would take a nice sniff. Now, in small doses, this chemical is perfectly fine. But to do it every day this close to the packet, that'll, that'll damage your lungs. Now, this particular chemical is currently under investigation for causing vaping was it vaping lung issues? So maybe there's some some interesting things coming out there. Uh, bottom left, we've got a picture of a spice. And props to anyone who recognizes that, because that is nutmeg before it's ground down into powder form. Now, I've actually labeled this in my spice drawer. It says nutmeg in little writing, also a hallucinogen. Because in large enough doses, it is a hallucinogen. But don't. You can eat it, you can snort it, you can smoke it, but it will it'll leave you with a long, long trip that isn't necessarily a nice one. You'll be tripping for two days. Side effects include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, nerve problems, and heartbeat problems that are potentially deadly. There were 67 cases of nutmeg exposure in 2010. And nutmeg intoxication epidemics were seen in the early 1900s, with a small resurgence seen in the mid-1960s. And of course, today, during this era of TikTok, there have been some famous cases. The Chubby Emu YouTube channel covered one of these where someone, I think, downed an entire thing of, of uh, pumpkin spice and, and got very, very sick. Arsenic earlier, I mentioned as inheritance powder. Well, back in the day before we had the colonic irrigation, which I don't recommend anyway, uh, people used to give themselves diarrhea on purpose. They thought it cleansed them out. And there's a story of a Victorian era gentleman who used to sprinkle on his porridge every morning to, you know, clear him out. And he once asked his wife, dear, I feel like, you know, I've got a big day ahead of me and I'd like to be, you know, more thoroughly cleansed. And she put on some extra arsenic and she was convicted of his murder. So again, you know, small doses of arsenic uh, will cause that rather than immediate death. Same for mercury. Uh, mercury was used as a treatment for syphilis back in the day. And it had some effectiveness, though antibiotics are, of course, better. There's an excellent YouTube video called This Much Will Kill You by AS ASIP Science that I highly recommend that goes through many of these in an amusing way. Now, I did accidentally poison myself. Uh, as, as some of you may know, I'm an avid gardener. You can follow me on Instagram at Seattle Food Gardener. And I grow my own rhubarb, among other things. Now, as anyone who grows rhubarb does or should know, the leaves are highly toxic. They contain very large amounts of oxalic acid. The stems, which are what we eat when we stew rhubarb or put it into other foods, contains 
a relatively safe amount of oxalic acid. It, it's fine. If, if you have problems with kidney stones, your doctor will say, don't have rhubarb and don't have dark chocolate or too much coffee. But for the average person, rhubarb stems are fine. Unless you have a lot. And by a lot, I mean, I downed a quarter of a jar in one day because I was feeling particularly gluttonous. And um, yeah, I got very, very sick that day. So even everyday foods can be toxic in ridiculous amounts. We've also got under that category of safe but in moderation, really delicious, crispy, high calorie, salty, highly processed, sugary, all these sorts of foods. And in the UK, when I lived there, they had some advertising campaigns specifically combating a certain type of these. Virginia. Some of these foods uh, in David's previous slide are very starchy, such as potatoes and bread, which have sugar and a naturally occurring amino acid called asparagine. Well, when you expose these types of foods to high heat, such as in roasting, frying, or baking, uh, you convert that asparagine into acrylamide, which is considered uh, carcinogenic. So in, when I lived in Scotland and I left three or now four years ago in 2017, there, there were these advertising campaigns saying go for golden but not brown when you're frying or baking these types of foods. Unfortunately, the campaign is no longer active, but it's something worth heeding, and that this is one way that I've changed my behavior today. Next up, Teflon. Another dangerous product that you may encounter in your every day is that nonstick pan. Prior to 2013, nonstick pans were coated with very small amounts of perfluorooctanoic acid, or PFOA. High amounts of PFOA have been shown to be dangerous. So after 2013, nonstick pans were coated instead with something called polytetrafluoroethylene, or PTFE. Now, the amount of these chemicals are very small, but the risk comes comes when you are heating that nonstick pan to temperatures higher than 300 degrees Celsius. Because coatings can break down and release fumes that cause flu-like symptoms. So if you do plan to cook at these higher temperatures, maybe consider an alternative like a cast iron pan. Another good piece of advice is to not keep your Teflon pan for 20 years. Replace it every five or 10 years based on how often you use it. They're not supposed to be passed down to your grandchildren. Next up, I'm going to talk about some everyday plants. I am, of course, Seattle Food Gardener on Instagram. That's at Seattle Food Gardener. You knew it was coming. Um, I don't know about in the UK, but here in Seattle, we've got lots and lots of foxglove. That's the photo in the top left corner. Um, that's beautiful, but eating it is like taking an unregulated dose of heart medicine. I'm sorry, Gwyneth Paltrow, but this notion that anything natural is safe is wrong. Lilies cause heart disease or heart, sorry, excuse me. Lilies cause kidney failure in cats. Every part of rhododendron and azalea is toxic, and I will be taking out my azaleas when I have kids. Hydrangea contains small amounts of cyanide. Mistletoe helps cause, excuse me. Mistletoe helps spread the kissing disease. And rhubarb leaves we've already discussed. I highly recommend the book Wicked Plants by Amy Stewart if you're interested in a well-written, basically A to Z of dangerous plants. So a known dangerous product that people consume anyways, and I do it too, I love myself a really good old fashioned, and that dangerous product is alcohol. And when you ingest alcohol, your enzymes convert ethanol, which is in alcohol, into a toxic compound or a toxic chemical compound called acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde causes cell damage in your body and your body is furiously trying to repair these broken cells. And because of this uncontrollable cell division, it leads to cancer. There's a really good Mother Jones article called Did Drinking Give Me Breast Cancer? Uh, that is very well researched and uh, well written. If you have time to read it, it's quite a hefty read, though. We're going to finish with some of our advice on how to research. Now, here we've got a bit of a hierarchy of how consumers tend to trust. And for a lot of people, their friends are at the top. They listen to them the most, followed by sometimes celebrities, uh, underneath that independent reviewers, and at the very bottom, maybe advertisements. We don't trust salespeople as much as, say, our closest friends. 
Whereas what we really should be doing is thinking a little bit more like how scientists trust, where we've got meta studies at the top, which is a, a, a study of studies where you look at many, many studies and you kind of come to a conclusion based on that. Underneath that would be a single study. Underneath that might be independent investigations and below that would be expert opinions. And down at the very, very bottom would be your friends. Now, there is this notion that everything causes cancer. We've all heard that phrase before, and there's a jargon term for it. It's called pessimistic induction theory. There's a rabbit hole for you to go down if you want to Google that. I've put here a very abbreviated chart from Vox. And in it, they look at this idea that some, sometimes we see, okay, so this week a study came out saying uh, wine causes cancer. Next week, wine protects against cancer. Then ne the week after that, it's going to be protects against cancer again. And this erodes people's faith and trust in the scientific method. Well, what, what meta studies do is they look overall at all the studies and they come to an overall conclusion. And here in this chart, we see on the right of the line, the number of studies and, uh, the, sometimes the, uh, so each red dot is one medical study and how far that it is on the right, the strength of the study. And they, they tally them up. So here we can see there are only three studies that say that wine causes cancer, but many more that say it protects against cancer. So overall, it might be that wine is better than it is worse. This, of course, depends on your personal uh, usage, how much wine you drink or your genetic predisposition or other environmental factors. But it's something worth keeping in mind when people bring up the, oh, next week, they'll come up with a, another news article or study that says the opposite. So another about... way... oh, sorry, you sorry. go, Virginia. Okay. Um, so how to research. Uh, start with good sources, uh, government safety organizations or science-focused media. <laughs> um, check publication dates. Maybe it's really outdated and old. Uh, you always want to try to get more recent information because there's always newer uh, scientific methods that come out and newer ways of analyzing that could help really uh, solidify uh, a hypothesis. Um, also look at author credentials and the site's original articles and sources of original sources. Uh, sources and original sources, because sometimes people might skew the original source in order to kind of um, change it according to their own whim. Uh, see both sides. I love this one. I love looking at both sides of the argument and um, seeing what really makes sense. Um, and also, are they selling something? Is that website you're looking at trying, are, are, are they trying to sell something? Yeah. Do they have an agenda? Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, stay calm. We've got pretty good safety standards. And if you're in a country that is in no longer in the European Union, consider just looking at the European Union safety guidelines. This is something that I recommend people in the States do because the FDA is often a lot more lax than the EU safety standards. Uh, use good rules of thumb. You might want to buy more reputable brands. Do your research, as covered in the previous slide. Uh, you might be paying more, whether that be in money, time, or convenience. And remember that there are worse things, such as all those other vices that you know that you are guilty of. I know mine. We can talk about that in the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really excellent. I have so many questions. Um, I would like to say that if you do have additional questions, please put them into the Twitch chat. Thank you very much, Virginia and David. We will have about a 15 minute break. We will come uh, back at 15 after the hour. I say that because, you know, you're in a totally different time zone. How do time zones work? I mean, when I moved to Australia, my dad was like, what's tomorrow like? Very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that was really incredibly interesting. Keep adding to the questions. Also remember to like upvote the ones that you really want answered on Slido, and we will come back at 8.15 UK time, and we will see you then.
Welcome back, everyone. We're very excited. We've been looking through your questions. We've had pet issues during the break. No one knows what will happen. Pandora is right here on the side. She knows you want to see her. She is resisting. She is being the p true, beautiful diva that she is. And uh, we'll see if she decides to make an appearance. So welcome back, David and Virginia. We're going to go through as many questions as we feel like is working. Um, and then we will uh, just wrap things up. So thank you, everyone, for your wonderful questions. The, I, the first one. Sorry, can I just introduce that? Izzy? Can I introduce Izzy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Izzy, please. Izzy is my six-year-old rescue, risk why am I so tongue twisted today? She's my six-year-old <laughs> rescue pit bull. She's she beautiful. is, I know, she's local satellite. She uh, works at a local startup <laughs> as their chief marketing officer. Um, they specialize in, in chasing squirrels and she does exceedingly job on, well on the job. So say hello, Izzy, to the entire people of the United Kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, affirming the fact that all men make dad jokes whether or not they have children. <laughs> we don't anthropomorphize her, though. She's not our daughter. Oh, of course. No, no, definitely if, not. That was not anthropomorphizing. None of that was. If anything, we will refer to her as a little old lady because she can be a bit grumpy like that. And when she's not wearing her collar, she we, we do say that she looks naked when she's not wearing her collar. It freaks us out a little bit. <laughs> Her facial expressions right. are already like giving me life. Okay, first Hello, question Izzy. from. <laughs> we love you, Izzy. You're so adorable. Um, first question is from Matt. I've heard organic produce probably brings more danger from pesticide consumption than the uh, than other sort of produce. Conventional is usually how people put that. So true, false, way too complicated. What's what's the deal, yo? Virginia, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, at, at least for the U.S., I'm not sure about the organic um, label uh, in the U.K. and E.U., but when uh, food, when produce gets tested um, for residual pesticides here in the U.S., uh, they are low. I don't know what that noise is. <laughs> they are lower <laughs> than, uh, oh, okay. They are low. <laughs> and uh, I think what the concern is, that there's not enough studies uh, that kind of focus on the pesticides that are used in organic farming. Um, so there is a bit of unknown in that regards, but it's it's really um, a tough question at this point to, to answer. But at least in the US, there are very, very, very uh, low undetectable uh, drug residuals uh, for organic and non-organic produce that comes into the market. I didn't hear half of what you said because I was telling the workers next door not to use power tools. I'm sorry about that sound. Only giving a webinar to hundreds of people. Okay. So um, I know that in, in the case of organic food, I mean, pesticides are used, but often different ones and different herbicides, et cetera. And Sarah, you're an environmental scientist. If you'd like to chip in, go for it. I did hear that uh, for, I think, a specific type of pea, there was a specific type of fungus, which the organic uh, herbicides weren't very good at killing. And uh, so that's a risk. Also, I th I'm not sure if it's the EU or the US or both. You can't irradiate foods if it's labeled organic. Is that correct, Virginia? Uh, that is correct. So they are not as long lasting um, as, in terms of shelf life. Yeah. And um, there are some foods as well where irradiation really is the best way of protecting against contaminants and, and other things that are growing. For example, herbs and spices are, is one category that, that they, they like to irradiate um, the food. And it is perfectly safe and it doesn't affect the flavor either. Interestingly, dairy products are affected by irradiation, which is why we don't irradiate them. Now, I do have a funny story. Uh, I had just moved to Seattle and I lived in an apartment complex with some rooftop barbecues. And one of the neighbors one night when I was cooking on the barbecue, I was, I was actually sitting down to my plate of ribs uh, and they came over and introduced himself. And I'm like in the middle of dinner. So it was a bit weird, a bit rude. And he started talking to us and, uh, you know, 
introduce himself, asked what we were eating, and and he saw that the the rib sauce, the sweet sauce I had next to it, was Kroger's brand, which is like a mainstream brand. And he said, "Oh, yeah, I would never eat that. It's got a, it's got all sorts of stuff in it. I only buy organic. I exclusively buy organic." <laughs> and then it came time for my turn to talk. He eventually stopped, and. I said, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm finishing off my master's of science in marketing. And one of the things that I study is how, how labels can affect people's perception of a product right down to the taste. And I have an entire talk on this on my website. Um, for example, uh, when people see the word organic on something, they or some people find that it tastes tastier just because of that label, even though it doesn't taste any different. And he did not take kindly to that mm. uh, that comment. Uh, he eventually no. left us alone. I, I really <laughs> didn't, didn't take kindly to that. Anyway, sorry, no. next question. Yeah, no, no, winning friends and influencing people. The only thing I would say as an environmental scientist is that the primary consideration of regulation is first and foremost human health. So I would say as humans, you probably don't need to worry. But if you're wondering why things like neonicotinoids and other things come up as a debate later on is it takes a lot longer to determine the ecological effects because if you think about it, once those things get out in the ecosystem, you know, you can have field trials and they do have field trials, but it's difficult to see the ecological effect for a lot longer. So you, um, I think you have to kind of self separate the health in the human health impacts from the ecological health impacts. And I don't think you should demonize things immediately when they do have an ecological impact. Personally, I think you should care about that, but I don't think that means you as a person should be scared when it comes when it comes up, because um, that they're just different regulatory systems and they require different scientific evidence. Okay, so the next one. My parents have always been nervous about the links between aluminium, or to our American friends, aluminum, and dementia. So all the alum aluminium pans were chucked out. Were they right to be worried? And of course, the other notorious thing is deodorant, right? Natural deodorant. We need natural deodorant because you're putting you're putting the aluminium on your pits, guys. Tell us, tell us more. Virginia, I'm going to let you talk, and then I'm going to talk about aluminium for underarm deodorants. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, it's it's hard to say aluminum. As an American, when I keep he hearing aluminium, okay, so <laughs> I might be going back and forth. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's different ways of spelling things. Miriam Webster, Webster just simplified the English language. Don't get so angry about it, people. Don't get so angry. <laughs> So um, in terms of aluminum, uh, there's a lot of just conflicting uh, studies. Like there's some study going back to that pessimistic induction slide that uh, David was talking about earlier. There's a lot of studies that say, oh, uh, there's a link between aluminum and Alzheimer's. And then there's a lot of other studies that say there isn't a link between aluminum and Alzheimer's. So there's really not enough uh, science to really justify which way, um, you know, this meta study still is trying to analyze all of the evidence. Um, I can say that people with kidney disease um, have a hard time getting rid of aluminum out of their bodies. Uh, so that might be a concern um, if you do have kidney disease, then that's something that I can't speak about. Uh, so you might need to talk to your doctor personally about whether or not that should be uh, a concern for you. So just yesterday or the day before, Life Hacker. Uh, released an article exactly on this. And um, what you just said, Virginia, was 100% correct. Um, and the number that they give is uh, if it's of particular risk if your kidney function is 30% or less. But if your kidneys are perfectly fine, then you're probably fine. Uh, there's another rumor that uh, antiperspirant use can lead to breast cancer. And according to the American Cancer Society, no. So low kidney function, yes. But for the rest of us, you're fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen the, um, from what I've seen, this may be wrong, but that the initial stuff about breast cancer um, was a bit like the um, autism and vaccine stuff where it was dodgy to begin with, and then everyone just ran with it. And then people, all these cancer societies have had to come out and be like, not 
no, that wasn't a thing. That was just a bad study. Sorry, guys. So beware of bad studies. Uh, yes. And speaking of vaccines, as if on cue, I genuinely didn't do that on purpose. Um, anti-vaccine activists like to talk about mercury and vaccines, question mark. Is this really a thing or is the mercurious har- mercury harmless or what? Do you want me to do this one, Virginia? Or Oh, um, I can jump in with like a little blurb. Uh, there, uh, There is something called thimerosal, um, and uh, that is a form of mercury. And that was used in vaccines for um, a long time. Um, this, there's such... There's such a small amount of it in vaccines um, that it isn't being seen as harmful. But, uh, you know, the government, at least in the U.S., has been kind of getting rid of it in vaccines um, and and pushing it out as a just-in-case measure um, because they don't have enough studies. Okay, should we skip to the other mercury question? Because my, my answer... Uh, actually covers mercury in general. So, what, sorry, the other mercury question. Which one? The mercury question was, oh, no, it was about amalgam in. Uh, oh, oh, no, the, okay, yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> this is a bit of a long question, so everyone bear, bear with me. So some of your images gave what looked like Reassuringly historic examples, albeit albeit fairly recent history, but what about today? For example, mercury amalgam dental fillings, Tony Robinson had all of his fillings removed. Following a link that was made between mercury and Alzheimer's disease, it was asserted that these dental fillings are completely safe. But when Tony asked to have a bracelet made from his own fillings, he was told, no, it's far too dangerous. So are they safe or are they dangerous? So on our website, dangerousproductstalk.com, we've got a link. uh, There's a tab at the top for further reading. And I'm just going to look here. So I've broken it down. We've broken it down by different things, for example, uh, lead, thallium. And if you scroll down to mercury, the second last link is a link to the US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. On that page, they have a list of different things containing mercury. For example, batteries, dental amalgam, jewelry, light bulbs, thermometers, and they give very specific advice for each of these items on how safe they are and what to do about them. So that is my further reading advice for you. Um, As for the rest of the question, do you want to jump in this on on this one as well, Virginia, or um, recent example? Um, There are other questions that are, that we're going to answer that sort of cover this as well. So I might answer those separately. Um, I know it doesn't matter, but I specifically went and got a mercury amalgam filling when um, a sort of holistic dentist told me they wouldn't do it um, because I didn't have proper dental insurance because I was living in America. And um, I haven't had problems with them since. The reason is that they're very strong. So you have to also weigh the two things up against each other. Mercury amalgam fillings don't erode very quickly. They're very, very strong. They're very, very affordable and they will last for ages. So they don't break up in your mouth like other types of fillings. Um, So talk to your dentist and do what's right for you. (laughs) And again, the the scope of this talk is just consumer products. And um, if you're interested in medical items, uh, I've got the copy of Quackery. Uh, highly recommend it. it it's mo- mostly historical examples, but as well, um, in our scope, we don't cover workers. And in this case, I'm going to refer again to the Ask a Mortician YouTube channel where Kate Doty mentions that um, often the um, materials in implants, such as dental implants or, or mercury and fillings, then uh, are exposed to um, mortician. Well, not mortician, uh, cremation staff. Mm-hmm. And there was a famous example of um, one worker who hoarded a lot of bodies and one theory was that he was exposed to a lot of mercury over the years from all those cremations and that's why he exhibited some unusual behaviour. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the same thing, isn't it, with um, hair products and formaldehyde and stuff like that as well. So with all of these things, there is a difference between 
worker exposure and consumer exposure, and you should probably care about both. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a consideration on multiple levels. So um, 20, <laughs> in 20 years or less, if you guys don't mind, I also have stuff to say on this, but in 20 years or less, are you going to be talking about the dangers or not of plastic nanoparticles in our bodies? Oh, I love that. <laughs> I, I love that question because um, I'm in the seafood industry and there's a lot of, you know, this big uh, plastic, uh, you know, island floating around in the Pacific Ocean and all of it getting into fish. So it is a very um, serious topic that I, I've had to encounter. Um, the good thing is, is that there's finally this coalition of scientists coming together um, internationally uh, to try to put forward more research in this area of, um, of nanoplastics. Um, so, it, I mean, I, I would love to know more. Um, and definitely in 20 years, I definitely want to be a part of um, just this evolution of understanding. And I can tell you <laughs> that um, with, uh, with oysters, uh, which are often found in the ocean um, and uh, have been studied with these kind of microplastics and uh, components that it kind of just goes into their system and into their, you know, little digestive tract and then they poop it back out um, into the ocean. Um, but we still need to see what's happening, right? Is it, is, is there something even more smaller molecular, molecularly that's happening? Um, and it's not only the oceans, right? The researcher also finding more information that these um, these nanoplastics are found in soils as well. So it's not just an aquatic problem. It's also a land-based problem. Um, so there's, there's a, I think it's the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, they're the ones that are bringing together a bunch of um, a bunch of scientists from around the world to push forward this information. And there was actually um, a conference a year ago. So if you, uh, and it was recorded. So if you want to go back uh, to those recordings, you can find them online and see what the talks were all about. Yeah, good. Do, uh, do you have anything to add, David? I do, but you're more passionate about it than me. So I'm going to let you talk about it next, Sarah, and then I'm going to give a more generic thing because this isn't quite my field. So Sarah, I'll let you go first. I mean, I don't, I don't really have anything to add, actually. I think Virginia did a perfect job of summarizing it. Most of the research that's been done so far has found that it doesn't actually impact the organism. And so far as we can tell, just because it's found in creatures doesn't mean that it's having an impact. That doesn't mean that we won't find that into the future. So you ask, you know, will, will we know, will we be worried about this in 20 years? We might be. But the answer is that we don't actually know. We're worried about it for a whole host of reasons. Um, and if you do want to see another video um, that's kind of related to what we do here to Skeptics in the Pub Online, QED replayed all of its, um, a lot of its 2018 talks. And you can actually see a video of the plastics panel we were on where we explained things about, you know, the Pacific Garbage garbage patch, what you might be able to do in your own life and that sort of thing. So I just don't think that we know. And I think with most, it goes back to that question about pesticides. I think ecological things, unfortunately, take longer to show and um, we won't know. Um, so unfortunately, we may be talking about it in 20 years and seeing that it's a problem, but we didn't necessarily see it as a problem now. But that's not because we don't care. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of part of the premise of the talk, that everything causes cancer eventually. And that yeah. pessimistic induction theory that I mentioned, that everything causes cancer eventually. Now, that's not quite true, but we're trying to sort of trying to reassure people that, that, yeah, that might indeed be true. And yes, we are absolutely going to be shocked that some everyday things we're going to tell our grandkids one day, we used to do this and the kids are going to go, no, just like we do the same with asbestos and lead and all sorts of other things. And yes, my grandparents and parents had stories. Please tell us stories on Twitch or on Slido or just email yeah. us because I love them. I, I've received some really great emails in the past. So uh, that's the premise of the talk, but also don't worry because there are things that you know 
that you were doing really bad right now or mediocre bad that you could cut down on or in my case I could work out more um try and relax I don't know how yeah. effective I've been let us know have I upped your have we upped your anxiety today or have we alleviated it motivated you I mean, my mother, my mother worked in made paint while she was pregnant with me. So you can interpret that as you will as to how I turned out. But she was actually physically making these very toxic paints while she was pregnant. I have got the Twitch feed open on my third screen right now. So guys, tell us, did, did I alleviate, did we alleviate your stress levels or up them? And again, I cannot recommend highly enough. Here it is. The lead, the, the sorry, the Dutch Boys <laughs> lead party. You can read this on our website, prominent link at the very top of the page, or you can watch the promo video all three of us made. A marketer, a biologist, and environmental scientist walk into a bar and we read a weird poem. It's yeah, worth absolutely. I mean, my, my mother is a toxicologist and she's now spending her retirement from a chemical company fighting against one of the chemicals that they made that contaminated the earth. If anyone wants to know more, more about that, just, you know, ask me in the pub later. I'm not paying attention to Twitch. I'm sorry. <laughs> David can tell me. Okay. So the next question, which items were you most surprised to discover are safe or unsafe? I didn't see this in the question list. Oh my. Uh, this one's caught me. No, it's been upvoted, I think, since we've uh, discussed it. Yes. Does anyone else want to go first? Sarah, you can jump in as well. Feel free. We've, we've oh, got... there's, a, there's a fantastic book if anyone is interested. If anyone likes makeup, there's a great book called It's Okay to Have Lead in Your Lipstick. And it <laughs> explains why there is lead in some color cosmetics. And it, it's not actually advocating for adding lead to your lipstick. It's much more complicated um, Fashion Victims is two, three years old now, but it talks about how a lot of mainstream brands have lead in lipstick. Now, lead is not listed as an ingredient lipstick because it is considered a contaminant and not an ingredient. Um, I think I didn't realize, excuse me, I didn't realize just how bad alcohol was and how was it five or six percent of breast cancer cases in the US, according to that Mother Jones, very well researched, very scientifically accurate article uh, r reports on. So that was the biggest shock. And it really helped me reduce or justify my reduction in alcohol consumption. Um, there's, there's a whole lot more that we couldn't fit into this talk that we include as bonus slides that if we're giving this at a museum or something like that, while people are waiting for the talk or waiting for the Q and A, we put them up and they've got all sorts of fun things like corsets and belladonna and all sorts of tobacco products, and we play tobacco jingles over the PA while people are waiting, which is really, really funny. But my answer is alcohol. And also reading the book Deep Nutrition by Dr. Catherine Shanahan, MD, um, this has helped me change my diet. And again, very well scientifically researched. She's a medical doctor based out of Hawaii. And we've swapped in my house vegetable oil for olive oil and other fats. We've generally upped our, uh, we, we, we eat meat in this house. So we have upped our organ consumption, reduced our corn fed beef consumption, upped our lamb consumption. We're we're actually spending the extra money on eggs for tastier and more nutritious eggs. These aren't necessarily dangerous so much as healthier. And again, you have to make your own decisions about how much you want to buy and uh, sorry, how much you want to spend on what you buy and what effort you want to go to, uh, to, to live the lifestyle you want to live. Do you have anything to add on that, Virginia, before I move on to the next question? I think I was very surprised as to what um, asbestos was put into, like those micronite filters. Um, that was surprising. I don't smoke, um, but, you know, just knowing that. Or there was a story in our last uh, time we presented this, there was an audience member who said that they had a parent who was a jewelry maker and they had this sheet of fabric that was, what was it? I think it was asbestos. It was asbestos. Yeah, it was um, it was not covered, but asbestos was kind of weaved into this piece of fabric to help um, the jewelry handler kind of deal with the, the heat, the extra heat. So I guess like for me, it was surprising to see all of these things in 
these these consumer products. It's also yeah. how far back you want to go in time. I mean, we wanted to make it consumer products, so 19th century onwards, typically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it surprises me how people will still play around with that. Like, when I see people doing home renovations and they just are like, I think that's asbestos. I'm going to remove it myself. And then they buy themselves a mask that is not appropriate. And I just don't get hey, me started on asbestos, actually. I, I, I lived and worked and studied for it, three months in Vietnam where safety standards for workers are non-existent. And I would just be walking down the street and shocked at the lack of safety harness and stuff like that. So after writing this book, I've got this bit of an eye for just seeing around us why we have these rules and regulations. And uh, that that's from OSHA through to, yes, consumer products. I am all for better regulation, not less regulation. Yeah. Well, on Amazon, you can buy a mask that says it's good for fighting um, asbestos. But I would assure the audience to not do that if you're doing a home renovation. And instead, contact a certified asbestos remover. (laughs) Um, That's your PSA. (laughs) Okay, so is there something that's commonly accepted today that you think we should not be doing, eating, or inserting? Inserting is my favorite bit. Thank you for adding the inserting anonymous. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. Colonic irrigations have a risk. Um, I, I have a colonic irrigation story that's not my own. Oh, no, it is my own, uh, but not my own colonic irrigation. I, so I was living in Tokyo. I went to Toastmasters, also like similar to Rostrum. A lot of people will have been to one of these at least once in their life. It's like a speech giving class. And this guy comes up. It's his turn that day. And he espouses the virtues of colonic irrigation. But his energy levels were so high. It was really freaky. And then he starts talking about coffee enemas. And I've had this moment of, aha, you had one of those before coming in there in here this morning. <laughs> Um, I have another one to talk about that we mentioned uh, privately in the background beforehand, but I'm going to let both of you hop in here before I talk about that and bring up another slide. Go ahead, Virginia. Oh, I mean, uh, I mentioned it in the presentation, alcohol. I love alcohol. We had a dry January and a low sugar January, so it was brutal. I'm glad it's February. Um, But yeah, that's something I should not be drinking, but I do it anyways. And um, social media? (laughs) I don't know. Virginia and I, we've got a new thing where we're quarantined, obviously, even though we're in the same city and we, we watch documentaries via the Netflix party feature. Is that the right name? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we watched The Social Dilemma last week yeah. on Netflix. Oh. Highly recommended. Okay, yeah. so um, my answer, and I'm going to bring up a slide, is skin whitening products. Now, I'll let um, one of you talk about legitimate skin whitening products. Over-the-counter ones in the U.S., um, you know, they contain all sorts of things. Uh, But if you're buying from a less reputable source, and they have a huge problem in California with people bringing these over the border from Mexico or buying online, uh, skin whitening products that contain mercury and other nasties, and people outright get poisoned. So if you are going to buy something like this, either go through your doctor or go to a brick and mortar store and buy a reputable brand. Yeah, and I would say as a skincare person, um, if you buy something that contains hydroquinone, that is an actual, like if you get it prescribed or fortunately in the U.S. you don't necessarily need a prescription. In the U.K. you do need a prescription. Um, so it's a little bit more challenging actually in the U.S. But if you're getting it from your dermatologist or someone that you know you can trust, hydroquinone is not about lightening lightening your overall skin. It's about like if you have hyperpigmentation, you can actually lighten it. So there are legitimate products that um, just because something says like, People are moving away from that, obviously, now, right? Because it's racist to be like, this is a skin lightening product. But for something that, like, lightens your hyperpigmentation, there are legitimate products, and you shouldn't be scared of all of them. It's one of those things that you just shouldn't buy from dodgy sources, which you could probably say about so many of the things that we talk about. Yeah, the documentary I watched the other day, I think it's called Broken on Netflix, about buying counterfeit makeup, um, so, yeah, they get contaminated with uh, toxic or uh, uh, infected, 
elements. Now, um, for skin whitening products, uh, they often specialize, and some of the ra- advertisements, they're hilarious and, well, hilariously racist, if you've got my dark sense of humor. They're, they're just disgusting. And I actually showed a couple of them when I presented at Skeptic Haley in Glasgow. I think it was like 2015, 2016. And, um, yeah, they'll, they'll specialize. They'll have like a special underarm whitening one and face ones, and you can lighten your vulva or your anus. It's, you know, because having a one product for multiple places isn't as profitable as making people buy many things as well. Um, have, have we got your slide? Are you, are you going to I'm done. I'm done with my, I'm done. Yeah, we can go on to the next question. I think people have. All right. Do you have anything to add, Virginia? Okay, um, so to what extent did people at the time know how dangerous they were? Did they sell them despite looking? I mean, Victorian pharmacies are like my favorite, so please tell us more. Virginia, you work in the safety industry. Either I can go first and talk about historical stuff or you can talk about modern stuff. Uh, why don't you do historical? And let me think okay. about modern. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the question was mainly about historical, but you can talk oh, about okay. modern. So we have Bitten by Witch Fever by a fashion historian. She's fa- she's fascinating and excellent writer. It's not a terribly big book because so many of the pages are pictures of really beautiful wallpaper. And then we've got Fashion Victims. Actually, I can't remember which one's by the, uh, the uh, academic who, who writes on fashion history. I think it was this one. Now, um, in the case of Arsenic, in dyes, in both wallpapers and fabrics that people would wear, they would shed arsenic granules um, and people would get very, very sick. And there were really interesting historic stories. Now, this is Victorian era. We always kind of associate here a lot about Victorian era. That's because Victorian era legalized the use of arsenic everywhere. Their French and German counterparts, both the scientific and political ones, were aghast and were lobbying for the United Kingdom to recognize just how bad these products were. And there was a very famous, ironically, environmentalist, um, famous environmentalist who owned an arsenic mine. And um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but for some reason the books mentioned him a lot as if he was very famous. And apparently he just refused to believe that the arsenic was that bad and he himself ended up getting poisoned. So throughout it, it was really interesting. I really picked up a pattern, especially in these two books, about people who just refused to believe it was dangerous or they just didn't know, or um, people who had an agenda. They didn't care. Um And we do hear about stories like the tobacco industry and other modern industries where the companies we now know knew how bad things were. And they created obfuscation and um, sort of counter campaigns to help on purpose make people unsure. They would spread this myth. And I I really like the movie. Thank you for smoking. Um, Oh, the book is great as well. It's so good. I did, I did it again, I'm promoting myself. I did a talk for the British Science Association before they showed the video. This is in conjunction with Edinburgh Skeptics. We used to do monthly movie nights and we'd get a scientist in to talk about the movie for 15, 20 minutes before we watched the movie. So one night they had a neuroscientist talk about isolation and deprivation tanks before the movie Moon was shown. And I stuck up my hand to talk about tobacco marketing and how big tobacco creates confusion about and gets around uh, well, creates confusion about the scientific research and consensus um, and as well just got around marketing restrictions so you can watch that on my website thedavidfrank.com or if you can't remember that davidtheaustralian.com and whenever i tell people that in america i tell them i used to be an english teacher so if you misspell australian i'm going to judge you all too many uh, americans don't know how to spell australian it's heretical i swear Wrong word, but uh, yeah. Look, that's Did my. Did confuse take. Austrian? That's my favorite. My favorite is confusing Austrian with Australian. <laughs> my my grandmother was Austrian, and whenever she'd get you know go back to Vienna, she'd bring me back a shirt, and one of them once said, uh, "Sorry, no kangaroos in Austria," which of course people read so fast they didn't recognize it. That was a tangent. I will let Virginia talk about um, whether people knew or no. 
Um, yeah. In terms of modern, I feel like there's just so much noise out there nowadays. It's so easy to kind of spread messages um, that we are constantly, at least for scientists, they're constantly trying to speed up their research in order to either um, support or rebuke some of these uh, theories. So I think in that respect, it it definitely gets the word out and um, companies are more inclined to uh, mitigate issues uh, of concern that consumers raise. So a lot of things are driven by consumer um, uh, opinions, honestly. So nowadays, yeah, I would say that I don't think it's likely, I don't think it's easier for companies to get away um, with uh, releasing things, um, unless they have some really good lobbying groups. <laughs> I feel like the, at least for the U S I think that, um, yeah, there, there's, I'm sure that there's a lot of internal research that happens in companies, um, that might not get released. So that's the, that's the other side of the, um, the coin, right? So, yeah, I keep saying politics is too important to leave to the politicians. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't get me started on the food pyramid. Whole history day. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of wrapping up here. So I'm going to take a little bit of editorial license on some of these, and I'm going to combine two of them to say. So let like let's talk a little bit about fit for purpose. This is what my PhD is on. I'm being a bit cheeky by choosing this, but um, are kind of the regulations fit for purpose? So that there's this idea that um, the FDA has better standards, or sorry, the Europe has better standards than the FDA, but some standards in Europe, um, and I will editorialize here, but are more about the precautionary principle rather than scientific as- evidence. So this person says, are they more protectionist than being based about scientific evidence? Um, and then the kind of second part of that question is, is that, you know, is there sort of some regulatory peer review? You know, what's the scientific review of these regulations? So it's it's kind of a two-parter in terms of how does science inform policy, which is my favorite topic. So I don't know if Scotland, you guys have a consideration on that. Scotland banned the growing of GMOs or I was there and... Uh, Frank Matchlin, I apologize if I am mispronouncing your name, Frank, did a great talk for Edinburgh Skeptics on how GMOs saved the papaya industry in Hawaii. So I'm pro-GMO, for example. So yes, absolutely. Um, Sometimes some countries are um, a little bit more precautionary. And in the case of the US, I think they're worse than the EU overall. But yeah, um, yes. (laughs) You, you kind of you, you can't take anything wholesale gospel, unfortunately. Generally, I do trust these things, but some things are more controversial. But then again, some of that controversy might be so, sown by people with agendas. Yeah, Virginia, what do you think? As a yeah, I totally, I totally agree. Um, so the U.S. right now has a regulation in in place recently um, with bioengineered. They call it bioengineered, but it's it's GMO. They just had to give it a, a different name. Um, but yeah. regulation is uh, basically for the consumer. It's marketing. It's not really because of it. You know, they're saying that this is safe or not safe. And you can find that in the regulations, but that doesn't get necessarily translated to the consumer understanding. So consumers can get mis- can get this misunderstanding that, oh, you know, it's labeled as BE. There's something wrong with it, right? So there is a disconnect between, um, you know, policies and what consumers um, kind of understand. So, yeah, I... Like, yeah, I don't know. I think that's. I mean, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. No, no, I was just going to say, I think it's a bit of a false dichotomy when people, people are always trying to compare Europe to the United States. And I think they just start from a different philosophical base, whereas um, Europe tries to be more cautious in saying, you need to prove to us that it's safe. And if it, if there's any hint that it might not be safe, then we will just ban it. Whereas the U.S. will say, if the balance of evidence suggests that it's safe, then we will assume it's safe until further evidence is provided to say that it's not safe. 
Um, so I think it's the, innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's like a, it, it's your com- how comfortable are you with risk? And the two systems are just have different levels of discomfort. Doesn't mean yeah. to say that one is right or wrong, but they both it, use science. They interpret them in different ways. Yeah. There's a jargon term for the U.S. system that I cannot find in my notes right now for that you know, innocent until proven guilty. I think that's also the premise of this talk that I get, we get why people are anti-vax or concerned about things just like in the UK right now about rolling out the COVID vaccine. The groups that are least likely to be comfortable getting the vaccines are people who are minorities, black, Asian, Middle Eastern. And these communities are the ones that have historically been uh, experimented on, like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. So I get why people are skeptical. And this talk starts with a whole lot of things that turned out to be very, very bad. But we want to also turn it on its head. A lot of things turned out to be safe. So it's not so much a... It's, I like to think of it as, would you prefer a simple lie or a complex truth? Yeah. Okay, um, we'll end on a sort of... which we'll, we'll give you a choice. Do you want to end on 5G or green potato? <sighs> Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> Come on. Somebody too. I'm ready. Look at Pandora. <laughs> I, <laughs> Pandora, what do you think? <laughs> I think we covered I think we covered 5G's. Another scary thing. I get why people are scared. Um and as for green chips, isn't green potato like it's got a uh, poison in it and you shouldn't eat green potatoes. Yeah. It's called solanine. Um, yeah. I kind of wanted the potato one. <laughs> Go for the potato one. Do you have a, yeah. Do you have a hypothesis? What is your, how much, how much green potato? I Philosophical as much as it is practical. It, it is. It is. Um, I think that, you know, it's hard to gauge how much concentration of that uh, solanine is in the green potato. Um, so I can't really say, you know, oh, if it is a sage green, then you should avoid it versus, oh, <laughs> it's, and, it's just a And what species green? of potato? What, what breed of potato? Because for tomatoes, different types of tomatoes have different le- levels of acidity yeah. and how the ripeness and the, the sunlight and the soil, it'd be the same for potatoes. Uh-huh. So um, I think about, that, oh, I think no, that it, it, it depends on your stress level. If it makes you feel better to compost it, then go right ahead and don't eat it. <laughs> about the 5G thing though, we had a slide that we culled and there was a story, I don't know if it's true. And it was about a town in Northern Ireland where the locals were protesting a 3G or 4G tower. I think it was a 4G tower going up. This is years ago. And um, they complained about all sorts of sicknesses, uh, gastric issues and skin issues. And this is at a big town hall meeting where they were complaining. And then the a representative from the mobile phone company stood up and before the crowd says, well, you guys have been having this lately, right? And they said, yes. And he said, well, the tower's been off for a couple months. And that was a really good example of the nocebo effect where you tell someone that something is bad for them and they will experience symptoms. And that's not to say that those symptoms aren't real. It is a testament to the human mind's ability to um, to experience things at suggestion. And I know myself, there's actually a scale for specifically smell. I'm really susceptible to someone mentioning something and I can smell it. Um, it's just part of the way that the human brain is wired. So this is why we do things like uh, double blind tests. And in my case, when I, an Australian living in the UK, proudly said Vegemite is superior to ve- to, to Marmite. Did I tell you either of you this story? It is. It's superior. I agree with you. You're right. Debate it. Debate it in Twitch. But I assure <laughs> you that Vegemite is better. I'm, I'm going to stick around on Twitch. So please, guys, continue the conversation um, with me. But uh, so I'm at a... A breakfast uh, with some friends and someone said, why don't we test it? We've got some Vegemite, we've got some Marmite. They literally blindfolded me and they not only did 
a bl blind taste test. It wasn't double blind. They knew what they were handing me, but they didn't just hand me A and B. They handed me one, two, three, four bits of toast. So it wasn't just a 50-50 chance of me getting it right, which one was tastier. Do either of you want to predict which one was tastier? And I've done I want to believe that. I want to believe that veggie might prevail. I want to believe too, but when it comes down to taste alone, I couldn't tell the difference. And I maintain that spreading a thicker paste, Vegemite is thicker, whereas Marmite is closer to a viscous fluid, um, that it, it feels better and it, the mouthfeel of Vegemite is the same. But realistically, I couldn't tell the difference. And I'm a Vegemite-loving Aussie. Mm. Well, I'd like to announce live on air that David has just lost his Australian citizenship. Um, so does anyone have any last words? <laughs> Stay safe and don't worry. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's a joke. David would never lose his Australian citizenship. Um, anyway, so if you want to continue the conversation, we also, don't forget, have the um, the pub, Lockins Razor. All that information will be in the Twitch chat. Continue your lively debate. I very much want to thank David and Virginia. Thank you very much. This has been so much fun. This will, of course, go on um, Skeptics in the Pub uh, YouTube page. You can see most of our talks on there. And I thank you very much for joining me. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Bye.